Okay, so welcome to the penultimate talk in the whole long series. It's my absolute pleasure to be with Patrick Shipman from the University of Arizona. And I think he's already put up a picture of a sunflower, so I'm very really excited that this is going to be up by the taxes. <laughs> That's something that we really need to talk about for a long time. You see, it's on the post, yeah. clean up the post, we're all dying. Oh, is that? That is. That's right, that's good. So over to you, Patrick. Well, thanks, Lydia. Thanks, Simon. And it's nice to see everyone. Good morning. And yes, that's a sunflower. See hi. And it's quite nice. It's a nice example of one. There's seeds. So there's been florets before that, and they've turned into seeds. And they have a shape. It's a diamond type shape. They're a little more elongated radially than. Uh, along the angle, angular direction. They are pretty much the same size throughout the disc. They get a little bit smaller in the middle. They come in, I mean, the famous thing is that they come in spirals. In fact, this is the relationship known for centuries, I think, millennia perhaps. Kepler was quite interested, for example, in the fact that you get these spirals and that there are kind of numbers associated with them, which we'll read here in a minute. And that idea that you have spirals here and the Fibonacci comes in, golden number comes in, is kind of dominated the discussion of these patterns. And working with Alan Newell quite some time ago and writing down partial differential equation models for the pattern formation here, the other piece of that we wanted to focus on is the fact that you get those diamond shapes underlying just the position. So the word phylotaxis, which is, the, the broad term here for these patterns means taxis, the arrangement of below the leaves. Um, but there's a plant form behind it that each, these are not leaves, these are seeds, but what's being positioned have a shape. And that's part of what's interesting here. So I like to call these phylotactic plant forms and focus a little bit more on the plant form part of it than the, say the number theory behind it. Partially because if you just broaden things and look throughout the plant world, you see it's not always those nice sunflower type shapes. I mean, you get so we got we saw diamonds just on that sunflower, but say on a swaro cactus, there's dominated by ridges or many cacti. If you look at pine cones, often it is diamonds, but sometimes it's more hexagonal shape, irregular hexagons. There's a cactus even with hexagons. And see if I have more pictures. But yeah, you can even see on other cacti, though, you do get the diamond type shape. Well, this is, that's interesting because these diamonds are um, elongated a different way. So these are not, these are not uh, diamonds that are elongated on the radial direction. They're actually kind of square almost, maybe a little more elongated along the angular direction. And these are pretty much nice, like nice little squares that, that tile that, that shape here. And so just to put that, that shape together with the standard or the classic uh, description of these things, if we, if we take the, the bracts of this pine cone and we just connect the, the bracts that touch each other, I'm just gonna do it in one direction here, we see the white spirals. And if we count them, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight, we get eight, which is, um, well, in this case, we get eight, counterclockwise spirals and 13 clockwise spirals. And the standard number, just to compare plants across nature, some 95% plants that exhibit this spiral type phylotaxis exhibit the, some, uh, some consecutive numbers in the Fibonacci sequence for the, for the numbers of spirals. And associated with that is that uh, what we've done here is just number the bracts according to their distance from the center. So zero is the closest to the center. Looks like I did one twice. Really? Is that a one twice? I've been like that for a long time. I haven't noticed. So, but okay, so in any case, so you're numbering them from the distance from the center. And then if you look at the angular, the angle between the one, one bracket and the next label one, say between zero and one or eight and nine, you get pretty much the same angle. It's a constant angle. And if you have Fibonacci pipe uh, helicaxis, it tends to be this number three minus square root of five over two, which is some variation on the golden number. So, um, so, so you always you always draw the lines 
from three directions there from zero, one, and two. Do you have that sets up the principal direction on the of the lattice? Or oh, that? these particular lines are just I'm three just lines. yeah, I'm just I'm, I'm focused. These lines are just to be thought of to to designate the angle. So zero to one, one to two. So it's already always zero, one, and two that should be in that. Well, um, you could do two to three, three to four. The, 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 this, the, so these green lines have nothing to do with the spirals. Yeah. 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 Um, so what's interesting about that is, I mean, of course, in the real plant, you don't really know exactly where the center is anyway, so you can't, you can't really measure exactly the angle. But what's fascinating and just related to the, to the um, well, idea that we get the golden number there, is if you were to just put down on the plane a set of points um, starting at zero going here into 200 square root of n, so the radius is going to be square root of n, and the angle is going to be you fix a theta, and then you just go around just like we said. And if you pick theta to be that golden number, you get a nice arrangement of points. And so the underlying, you could say lattice, the philotaxis, say for a sunflower. If you just slightly, actually, I forgot what the number is here. Um, so let's go to the next one, where I've just slightly varied that number. So uh, this is the golden number. This is three eighths. Three eighths is an approximation of the golden number up to the third digit, um, well, decimal point. And look at the difference. I mean, of course, it's rational. So you're going to get, get the denominator of eight. So everything is going to lie on eight rays that go out from the origin. But just that tiny little difference between uh, golden number and three eighths, it's such a completely different pattern that you get out. So it's a nice way of visualizing the difference between this irrational number and a, a rational approximation. Uh, so we'll go back to that. So the kind of the number theory that underlies these, these uh, this packing. But to emphasize again that in the end, we're going to be interested in not just the positions of the plants, but the underlying plant form. This is a really nice picture from a book by Williams in the early 1900s on philotaxis. And he actually took cross sections, he took plants, cut them, and made these images of them, so he's drawing. And the point here is that if you were to just take out the drawings underneath and just look at the numbers he's put on, he's numbered them sort of backwards. One is the outermost, it needs to go in, you get closer, you know, as higher numbers are closer to the center. But you see the numbers are approximately at the same exact positions in these three examples. But the underlying leaves have different shapes. And you kind of um, title these, these, uh, these disks here with shapes of the same shape, but in, in the same positions. Um, in this case, he actually lets them change in size, but you can do it either way. So um, that's the interesting thing about this, that you could get different shapes for the same lattice. So let's pause here and just look at our observations. Uh, classical observations is the first one, helotactic patterns that they commonly uh, follow these Fibonacci spiral and whirl arrangements. That's when you get those ribs that go out rather than the nice spiral pattern. And um, then there's a plan form behind that. So you know, ask yourself, okay, and this is quite amazing that for so many years, until maybe the past couple of decades, it's been quite a mystery how those how those those leaves first form as a typical plant. So a plant is growing, the leaves form, they put into some arrangement. You know, what is it? It is the biological mechanism for the formation of new leaves. It's been quite a mystery for a long time. And as I was starting doing this with Alan, it was still not really known. So we first started with a biomechanical mechanism that Paul Green at Stanford had proposed. He said it was basically a buckling of the of the plant as it grows and later then there was also pointed out that there's sort of oxen oxen is a hormone that causes growth that there's oxen gradients and um so one can put those two mechanisms together to actually understand the, the plant forms that occur um but besides the just what are the chemical mechanisms um, why you get fibonacci spiral world patterns and so just the philotaxis, the arrangement, but then also the, how can you get the same arrangement, the same positions of the of the points, but a different underlying plan. But and I and I think I can give you know at least plausible answers to the first three. And what I'd like to focus on today for the experts here is what do we actually need? So there's been long proposed that there's an optimal packing behind the choice of the Fibonacci numbers and so on. And 
it, I mean, it's what you could do is just say, okay, around every point that we labeled there, you put a circle and you know, largest circle possible, and you see how, what, what percent of the, of the disk you've covered. What I'd like to do is just say, okay, if you think of this not just as circles, but the actual plan from underneath, squares or, or diamonds or so on, how do we think about the optimal packing? So I, I don't really have a, a totally you know, formulated answer to that, and so you're welcome to you know, answer it for me or, or help out on that. Too. Um, okay, so roughly, though, is that, yeah, okay, so um, there's a nice interplay between biochemical and chemical mechanisms that I think um, that we propose uh, determines both the positions of the of the of the plant of, of the phyllo of the, of the leaves and the of underlying plant form and then a really nice sort of classical thing in pattern formation theory where you get this wave number resonance wave vector resonance that really leads to the Fibonacci pipe pattern but let's just think about so sort of in three stages here and I think we'll only do the first one but we might touch on the second piece and then so so kind of these things I'd like to talk about just how could we just arrange the disk. Actually, we're going to do it on a cone because it's a little more um, nice to just think of a cone as sort of an approximation of a typical plant to, to work with for the moment. And then what we could do, uh, don't think we'll get to that, but I might just show the pictures that we could just project it onto a circle, put all the points of the circle, so not, not deal with the radial direction until that already looks at a lot. And then, um, yeah, we probably won't say anything about it, but the third thing we could do is just talk about the, the mechanisms and the partial differential equation model that could underline that information here. So let's um, step back a bit and just relate this to another problem. Well, um, the following question, which is related, but um, it may not totally clear right away, uh, which is that I just gave you a cone. And I might ask, okay, how could you put, say, a square tiling? Uh, so think of those diamonds or the squares that we saw on the on the um, tip of a plant or on the sunflower. How could we like maybe put a square tiling on a cone like that? And you could do it if you just take a square tiling in the Cartesian plane, cut out a piece here, and then uh, associate the red pieces. You know, where you'd make a cone out of paper, and you'd get. You have a picture, probably not, but you, could, you can make this any right angle on that Cartesian grid would allow you to do that. But the problem here is that you would always get a cone of the same angle, and it's always the same cone. And I think it's the case that you have to put those red lines at a at a right angle in order to, in order to really, you know, when you associate them, that the, that they match up at, at the edges there. And so really, that's the one cone that with this method, you can you now just easily totally tile it with a square. With a square pattern. So if you want to do other cones like this one, which is pretty nicely tiled and it's not the same cone, how would you how would you maybe not cover it totally, but maybe if you wanted to put squares on that, what's a way of doing that? And here then we're going to step back a bit and um, we'll try to use the method that few taxes would um, tell us or suggest that we could use. And we've seen already the importance of uh, the golden number, the relationship between the irrational golden number and a rational approximation. So it makes sense that maybe we could understand a little better that relationship. Irrational numbers, rational numbers, how do you approximate them? And not like we have to do this, but I think it's really fun just to delve into kind of the continued fraction background for what we're, you know, sort of this, this construction of a, of a tiling on a cone. So, oh, I don't, so I, I first saw this, maybe if you have grade school kids or some of you've done this, but I um, saw this in a kind of history of math course and it's for teachers in the US mostly. So, um, you know, we were, you know, this is how they were learning how to sort of teach how to find the greatest common divisor of two, of two integers. I think it's just so cool, isn't it, that if you have like four and I want to find the greatest common divisor of four and six or seven or eight, you make a four by six rectangle and you cut off a square and then you cut off and what's remaining, you cut off another square and then you're left with a square, and that's a two by two square, and that two is the greatest common divisor of four and six. That's fine. Okay, so four and seven, you cut off a square, you cut off a square and it remains, you cut off a square, cut off a square, you're left with a square, it's a one by one square, one is the greatest common divisor. You can do that as four and eight, you get a four by four square at the end. Really fun way of visualizing the greatest common divisor. Kind of related to, I mean, this, this Euclidean algorithm for finding greatest common divisors. Um, well, it was kind of related to how Euclid would have maybe described it back in the elements a couple thousand years ago. And that same idea 
is related to just how one way that he would describe someone what's so cool about the golden number. Right? So if you took a rectangle, one side length here, and then the golden number side length here, uh, it's a just a different version of the golden number, and you just cut off a square, you 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 cut off a square. So what we should be left with is the greatest common divisor one and that, or the golden number, whatever that would mean. But you see the fact that the golden number is infinite, that it has an infinite decimal expansion, and that you never end. You know, you just keep on going on forever, you never get a square. And the fact that um, the golden number, I mean, the, the thing about the golden rectangle is that you always, I mean, you always back with the same rectangle after you cut one square, just scaled. So you're always going to be doing the same thing over and over. You're not like sometimes going to be cutting off two squares like you would if it's one and a square root of two or, or something else like that. And so um, that's related to the continued fraction expansion. So for example, if you found one and the square root of two, you cut off one square, then you have to cut off two squares before you start cutting off squares of a different size. And, and then you cut off two again. And so if you wrote the, the, the golden number, or say so square root of two and its continued fraction expansion, you get one, which is that one square, two, which is these two squares, two, which is these two squares, and so on forever. And this, this method of construction um, sort of picks out the continued fraction expansion approach to writing out um, an irrational number. And that's what, it, that's what we like to do here now is just, uh, so this is the notation that a number um, the, the, the right way, actually, to think about the infinite expansion of an irrational number is, is the write down its continued fraction expansion, golden numbers, one plus one over one plus one over one. And so in general, these numbers are going to be integers. So we're just going to write this as a, a rational, or any number could be written as a not a one, a two, a three, which are the numbers that appear on the left there. Okay, so it's really cool, just a bit more history. That uh, and it's partially just to to uh, motivate what we'll do in a minute here to try to produce our our grid on a cone is that one of the earliest I would say the earliest really nice example of someone doing this dynamical system is in those early 600s in India where they were trying to find you know solutions to x squared minus n y squared equals one effectively right so greeks had done had kind of done this too because they realized that you know they couldn't really find rational solutions to x squared minus two y squared equals zero so they put a one there effectively and so now we can and so we get you know it's kind of cool you get approximations to the to the square root of two by solving that but the, the way that essentially was done in india is you, you find a recurrence relation that allows you to find points on the parabolas that that represent that um, or the hyperbolas that represent that that expression. We're going to see hyperbolas in a minute, which is why I say that. I also think it's really cool. This is the really beautiful example of a like an a, just like doing dynamical systems to solve a problem in, in early math history. Um, continued fractions themselves um, actually weren't defined maybe 1600s, 1700s by Wallace and then Huygens, who and if you see, this is Huygens Planetarium, tried to make a Sort of this mechanical thing that does the earth and the sun around it or, or whatever the, the solar system and he actually for the earth the, the 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 time that it takes the earth versus saturn to go around the sun um huygens used gears of seven versus 206 uh protrusions and that is a approximation to the to the actual ratio well at least the better ratio and um so he was essentially using continued traction expansion you, you truncate that uh, continued fraction expansion, and you good, you get a very good rational approximation. Oh, so that's all just for fun, but it's just showing that continued fraction expansions are really fun. Because like, because when I was an undergrad, you know, there was like research opportunities available, and I saw continued fraction expansions on one of them. I was like, find this number is this plus this plus that. It's like pretty boring, but it turns out to be so fundamental and fun. We're going to see it here again and to try to solve this problem to to um, to uh, pilot. I would get some around coming. Okay, so um, yeah, so um, just to put some notation again here, so we're just going to use the whole number as an example. So if we just truncate that continued fraction expansion, so I use the first three integers, we get three half. And we're going to so that's called an approximate, and um, this has a as a this p two and q two are rational number integers, and you get a sequence of integers as the numerators and denominators of these truncations, and if you take the limit. You get here the golden number, but you could down or you could write down a recurrence relation on the top and the bottom for the for the golden number. You're just doing the numerators add to get the next one, the denominators add to get the next denominator. So it's kind of fun, fun way of adding. 
And here's the statement that's related to the, 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 the claim that, that continued fraction expansions are the best way to represent an irrational number. It's this, that if you were to you know, truncate this continued fraction expansion at any point and just look at the rational approximation to the, the number. Um, so if you were to look at all fractions with a denominator of eight or less, this is the one that best approximates the original number. So, because you, you can always say, okay, I, I can get a better rational approximation by just choosing a larger denominator. But if you like say, okay, I don't want to do larger than eight, you know, there's some, you know, you can only write down a finite number of digits there. So I'm going to say eight is the best, uh, largest I want to write, and then that's the best. So, um, yeah, so this, this rational approximation is better than any other approximation um, with a denominator um, less than or equal to that, that particular denominator. Okay. So, um, so, for example, I'm not saying thing, square root of two. We're going to look at the square root of two in a minute. So it's good just to get that one in your in your mind too. So the continued fraction expansion of the goal number is one 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 one, uh, depending on which version of square root of two would be two 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 forever. Okay, but a real problem is that to put uh, to put these uh these squares onto this, this, and we couldn't do it nicely for a right angle cut. But to do it for, it, or and actually, no, this is the best best way of doing it on this, but it's a pretty good way, but that's motivated by philopactus, but also motivated by, um, here's another way of thinking about continued fraction expansions. Felix Klein, early 1800s, uh, was sort of geometricizing um, everything. And or late 1800s, early 1900s. And this is the way that he thought about um, and actually, uh, elementary mathematics from an advanced standpoint. This is for sort of grade school teachers. And he was showing how to think about continued fraction expansions. And the way he thought about it is, well, you, you take a lattice, just the integer lattice. Um, and so just the Cartesian grid, you, you don't see the grid behind there, but just you know the points P comma Q or P and Q are integers. And you draw a line of a certain angle, omega. So think of omega maybe as the golden number. And then you find the convex hull on either side, meaning just like take a, the way he describes this, you take a string and you just wrap it around on either side of that, of that line. And so it's all the points that are closest to that line. And those points, he says, that's the numerator denominator of the, of the, of the, of the rational approximates to that, to that number omega, which is the slope. Right? Because these are like the points that almost lie on the line. So the y over x determines the slope. Okay. It's a really nice way, fun way of seeing that. And what you get here, which is useful for us, is that these, these lines, uh, if you continue it like this way and that way, you get hyperbola type things on either side of that, of that line that Klein draws. And so, well, that's just the more examples, right? So just for the golden number, we draw in lines. Golden number, the one we've been working with, is this um, one, one, one continued fraction expansion. And that will be the, just the picture. Of the, of the rational coordinates. Okay, and that's an example of then the hyperbola that we get by finding the convex hull on either side. And what I'd like to do here is, um, I mean, it's more natural than to think, let's, let's think of uh, any one of these lines. So, um, so that's like the golden angle slope. And we're gonna take a line which is orthogonal to that and just think of those as like characteristic coordinates almost. Think in, in, you know, that's your y-axis, that's your x-axis. Then I'm going to claim here, which you can show pretty easily. So, you know, this again, this would be like where our slope was. So now just our lattice has, has rotated. And the red points are the convex hull on either side of that, that line that we originally drew, which is the y-axis. And I'm going to claim here, it's not just looks like a parabola, it actually lies exactly on a parabola. And for the golden number, it's y equals one of the square root of five times x. And that's going to be an important hyperbola, sorry, not parabola, but hyperbolas. That's going to be important hyperbolas for us in constructing this. Um, but what is really important from the perspective of philotaxis is a second observation, which is this. And in fact, this is an exact, this is an, an exact statement, meaning that you can, okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to compress in the y direction and stretch in the x direction equally so that you have an equal aerial transformation. 
So this lattice, you're not, you're not, you know, every, you know, every sort of region associated with any point stays the same area. So we're going to compress, so we're going to multiply the y-axis by one over gamma and multiply the x-axis by gamma. And what I claim that all that does is you can pick the right gamma, it's related to the golden number, and you can move that red point to that one, that one to that one, that one to that one. So you're just like sliding these red points down this hyperbolum, and they actually come back exactly, you know, you just get a periodicity, right? Because you do this over and over again, and you're just pulling those, and then just flow, allowing those red points to flow down that hyperbolum. Okay, so the next thing we're going to do with that is to think, okay, we're going to take this lattice, and we're going to map it to a disk or a cone or whatever. And in a way, that's equal aerial. And the way you do that is you, you, you take, this is the square root of the radius, and this is the angle. So angle, square root of radius, that's an equal aerial transformation. And you can map this lattice to a disk. Now you have to do a little bit of a, a, little bit of a modulation because it's not periodic in the x direction because we took a rational, you know, irrational number here. Um, but you can approximate, I mean, you can just, I'm not going to remember exactly what you do, but you can just, um, the, so the green points are periodic, um, and you make it 2 pi periodic in this direction, um, so it's almost the same lattice, and then you can map that onto the disk, not exactly what the what you do there, but whatever, you can think of a way. Um, okay, so remember, square root of radius angle, we're going to map that to the disk. And let's do a bunch of things like that. And I'm going to do one more thing. I think I'm going to do all the things at the same time. So if you map that to this, you basically get those points that we were showing earlier, where we were just taking um, uh, equal angle around and square root of, of n as you go out. Okay. So, um, but I'm going to do one more thing. I'm just going to propose a function that we're going to draw on the disk. And that function is just going to be proposed through its Fourier representation. And it's just going to be like if we had periodic functions with wave vectors that are equal to um, the vectors from the origin to each of these red points. So we're going to take each of those red points as a vector. For each of these, we're going to take cosine of that vector times r theta. That's like the Fourier representation. And then what I want to say is that the angle is that the amplitudes associated with this representation are going to be largest for the red points that are closer to the origin. So what I'm going to do is take one over the length of that wave vector. And this is just totally for fun, a construction. And I'm just, just seeing what happens. And we plot that and, and see what happens when you get this. So that is a, a picture of a, um, on, on the disk. Because I'm plotting in radius and angle. And it's that function. And um, from what we've done there, I mean, so we've made use of that hyperbolum, which is those, you know, all these weight vectors are determined by that convex hull. And um, you know, we just made up this function. But what you're seeing there is um, sort of a philotactic pattern for let's see how can we probe really what we've done here? What we can do is take contour contours of it, and you're saying, you know, it's kind of neat, because you get almost exact squares. In fact, if you pick the right contour, I claim that you get exactly a square. It's, it's really, it's really cool. Um, and a um, lot of really interesting just things that pop out. If you actually look at a sunflower, you see these, you see these, uh, these squares, and we haven't gone to the, we have to think about the, uh, the whole thing that they're really diamonds, but, you know, we, we can deal with that in just a bit. But um, so suppose there were squares. If you look at a sunflower seed head, you'll actually see little um, little protrusions that appear at these these points, these around it, which you get by this function as well. So just that's really cool. You just and I don't know why or exactly, but you get something that really actually quite well represents a sunflower. Can, can I? Yeah. You might be about to talk about this, yeah. but I, I wonder um, how how rapidly does the Fourier series converge? So how, how much can you truncate? Can you truncate by like two or three terms and still get a nice picture, or how many do you need? Well, yeah, so um, if you truncate to three terms, so if you were to say at any radius, I'm just going to pick the three terms with the largest amplitude, what you get as these shapes is the Voronoi tessellation associated with the points, almost exactly. Yeah, it's, it's really so neat. So three terms is already pretty good. Yes, but what's really neat is it actually gives the Voronoi tessellation. And then these extra terms get closer and closer to, so I would say um, five is about what you need before it looks pretty good. Here I probably did 10 or something. Yeah. If you got any idea why 
you first get to the foreign by translation? Not really, no. Yeah, I mean, it's constructed in a well. Um, I mean, kind of, because the Voronoi tessellation, you take two points and you try, you know, you kind of draw a line in between them. So that's almost like taking a periodic function in between them. So it's like saying, these are the points that are closest together. I'm going to take a wave that goes in that direction. So I, that's the best I can do. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> you probably do it better. Yeah. yeah. Um, so this is the uh, same kind of thing, but just zoomed in. And kind of what's happening, actually, is you could write down, so these amplitudes, we just took one over the, the modulus of the wave vector, but you could actually write down a function that's now a function of the radius and make that amplitude a function of the radius. And uh, really what's happening is you get, you know, so really what I've said is for each, you could, so we've, um, for, uh, this 2, 3, 5, 8, 13, 21 is, is, is representing the, the wave vectors that we have here, um, the sequential wave vectors. And really what they're saying is that underneath all of this, there's a, there's a function, constant function, that as you move out in radius, is like a wave that just moves out, and that determines these red points or the amplitudes for those various wave numbers. So it's like as you move out in the stereotactic pattern, there's a wave, there's an amplitude wave, it's a propagating wave. In that, in that sense, um, and you can modulate modulate that that amplitude function there, so you get diamonds instead of squares. I'd say a little bit more about that. If I exa forgot exactly, it's been a few years. Forgot exactly what. I mean, I have the function there, but I forgot exactly the reasoning. But you know, you can think about how you might how you might do that. Okay, so the, the other thing is that, okay, so, you know, I've almost said, okay, so what have I said here is, I mean, we've, we've made kind of a square tiling kind of on the, um, on the disk here, not on the cone yet. Um, what I'd like to do is to compare that just with this um, tiling of the disk by squares that's related to that function. So if you zoom in there, you see what we've done. It's just made squares that are rotated a certain way, positioned on that underlying philotactic lattice. They don't intersect. You can maybe make them a little bit bigger, but I think now you can't, right? So I made like an equal sized square throughout this thing. They don't overlap anywhere. That kind of determines the maximum size of the square. And then you could calculate what fraction of the area is covered by the black square. I think it's, it's approximately 92% or something like that. So it's a pretty good, it's a pretty good cover. Uh, but actually, so, and um, so, yeah, here's a little bit of a letdown. Maybe I, I have a function here for like a formula for these squares. I don't remember exactly what it is. I have the MATLAB code, so I could get it out. But it was determined by looking at that function we just graphed and sort of guessing at what the, or what the rotation of each square here is. I um, also have no idea kind of how to like prove that this is like a, that there's a, you know, and what's, I don't even know how to say exactly what I mean by the fact that this is like the best kind of tile in some sense. So that's where someone might be able to say, here's the way to, a way to think about it. Yeah, but just the, here's a nice, I think, in my covering, and there's a formula somewhere that describes the positions and rotations of these squares. But what's a more exact statement? I'm, I'm really not sure. Um, but what you can do now with this sort of tiling, um, you can so you can make them diamonds and so on. And we could cut a right angle and we could do exactly what did we did before. But you can also actually you can modulate that formula to so that it's going to be periodic with any cut. And that's the point here. So I could take any cone at any angle. And they could write, you know, just modulate that formula a little bit and, you know, you just make it two pi minus something periodic rather than two pi periodic. And there you go. And you can cut at any angle and you can make a, you know, 92% good square tiling on a, on a cone um, for any, for any cone angle. Um, so some few holes there, meaning that, you know, I don't really know exact statement of, okay, here's a, you know, really nice tiling of the, of the, um, uh, of a disc or a cone or something. But, um, well, I think it would be nice to figure out what a you know, better statement would be. And again, I have to emphasize, because since Alan and I sort of did this work on, you know, we're actually looking at mechanisms and trying to do a partial differential equation, pattern formation model of this, of these phylotaxis, there's been a lot of models of phylotaxis. And everyone keeps on ignoring the fact there's a plant form underneath. And I think that's the really cool part of it, because I think this says a lot about the biology. I mean, if you're going to form these sunflower seeds, well, I claim even this function here is giving you the shape of that seed. You know, saying a lot more, not just the outline, the fact that you have diamonds. You look at the function you get out here, it's so much like a sunflower seed that you that you get out. In fact, it's, it's interesting because you truncate it at like 10 or something, and you get actually those little indentations in the, you know, if you think about a sunflower seed, it's not a totally, you know, yeah, flat slide. You see, 
really well approximate a sunflower seed. So I um, think there's a lot in that, just that Fourier representation that's that's of interest for the biology. Um, so an idea might be to let's stop here 40 minutes and we could do that and just you know talk about things, but um, let's see what's next here. Oh, what's kind of fun is just, you know, you could do the same exact thing. Uh, you could say, well, why are we doing this golden number? It's this, because uh, that was motivated by plants. And so, and it makes some sense. I mean, it's a nice, nice highlight. Um, but we could just do the same exact thing for the square root of two. And square root of two, by the way, is very annoying because you know, I'd like to say, look, it doesn't look as good. But the square root of two is so good to being a really good irrational number. You know, so, so the idea of how irrational a number is, is that if you want to make a certain good approximation, how far do you have to go out for the continued fraction expansion? And for the golden number, you don't have to go out very far for the square root of two because the, the, the two is bigger than one. I mean, because the, 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 uh, those integers in the continued fraction expansions, the larger they get, the farther you have to go out in the expansion in order to get it. But you can do square root of three. And you see what's happening is that the shape, if you do that same function, the shape is not exactly the same. You don't need, there's a lot more white space. So the more irrational number is, the, the, the worse of a covering that you actually get on that, on that picture. Right. Um, so what you should, what I should have done here is like E or something or some number that's you know, like really, ir like not really that irrational you now because it's it almost behaves like a rational number. So that's the idea though, that really, um, since then I've become a really big fan of continued traction expansions. Partially because of this, partially just looking at the history, just so much neat things. So that's, you know, it's really changed my mind about when I used to be against them. Well, against them, it was, it was pretty boring. Um, but they're, they're really cool things, and I think they, they're related to tiling in some way. Um, but I still don't really have, I mean, I have some sort of ad hoc ways that I think of putting together some representation that looks like a Fubotaki platform, but I don't really have a you know exact answer to that question about optimal packing. Just the suggestion that rather than just looking at circle packings, we should be saying more about the underlying platform. Um, so various adventures we could go on now. I'll let you choose. Um, let's say a little bit more just about how you could even look at this on the one-dimensional space, just projecting, don't even go out in radius. Or you could just talk about the record stop. Happy either way. You can count on, please. Anyway. Okay, I, I can at least give maybe a little bit, uh, yeah, a little bit of just idea how this could be even simpler because we've gone out into the plane or into a disk or something. But actually, any comments or questions first on this? Yeah. Can I ask about this approximating as periodic? Oh, yeah. Um, in the end, it doesn't make a big difference because the further you out, the further you go out in radius, it, it's all, I mean, it, 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 you know, it limits to, because what you're actually doing, it's, it's gonna, when, when you do the approximation, you have to make it two pi radius periodic, like because the I mean that 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 distance in the x y plane. Think of the distance as actually the arc length around. So you pick a radius and then you're going to go around like that. So when you get way far out in radius, it's well you you've slightly modulated the pattern, but not by very much. So it actually it it, it approaches that uh, that original perfect nice interval. Yeah. The hole at the same time. That's a little bit annoying, the hole at the center, right? Um, I'm not sure how close or much closer to the hole we could get by yeah, the choice. Yeah, yeah, there's always going to be a little bit of a, I don't know, it looks pretty good. But um, yeah, there's always going to be a little bit of a hole at the center. Yeah, yeah. But you, you see that on plants too. They're always a little bit weird at the center, actually. Yeah, so that's, yeah, they're just pointing out there's not much that you can do. Yeah. Can I ask also about yeah. the, the plan form? You talk mostly about squares and diamonds and things and showed okay you modulate the function. Yeah. Was that principled or was that just you modulated the function and saw how to go with square diamonds or yeah, yeah. If I give you some some other views if you <laughs> yeah. Um so at the time, and it's been a few years, it was somewhat principled. So I'll, I'll give you kind of the, uh, the, the, the like rough background is that, um, yeah, I mean, I think it's really interesting. Sometimes you see diamonds, sometimes you see squares. I actually don't quite know if you get a better tiling by diamonds versus squares. In other words, if you are, I think the answer is no. I think it's the exact same tiling. I mean, the, the percentage that's covered by the discs or by the, by the squares or diamonds. Um, the, I, what it was motivated by was 
So when Alan Newell and I first looked at sort of mechanistic models for pedophilotaxis, we took what was the maybe the best suggestion of the day, which is that the plant is growing, the outer skin buckles under a differential growth with the underlying material, and you get a certain wavelength, and the F determines maybe the size, the, the size of that square. Um, and then it was saying, well, actually, there's also mechanisms related to the transport of the growth hormones. And th there's a pattern just determined by that. And the wavelength for that pattern might not be the same as the wavelength. And it turns out you can basically take the ratio of the two wavelengths, and that can stretch that square in one way or the other. Um, so really how that was determined was by looking at the, the amplitudes that you get out in that and then modulating that function we had in a certain way to do that. And it's, it's a little bit better. I just can't quite answer now because I have to go check what the function was. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, but the, yeah, so the comment here is that, man, we didn't even have to, we couldn't make this much more simple. We could have just looked at all of this without the whole radial direction. We could have just seen what's happening in the angles. And so this is um, some fun work with Francis Mata and Bethany Springer a few years ago. And it um, just comes back to the picture that we had here, which was that you put these points down, um, sequence of integers, uh, square root of n is the radius, and then two pi or the n times theta is the angle. And based on if you pick Golan number or some other number, I think it was E actually, um, you see a very different, you know, sort of nice, I'd uh, say this is more optimally packed position of the points than the, than the right hand side. Okay, no, but you could project those points uh, with pi actually on the left hand on the right hand side. You could just say what is the angle, not even worry about changing the, the radius. And you see that again. That the um, as you just put down 50 points here, you see for the golden number, it's you know it's pretty well distributed around the circle, whereas for four minus pi, you get these big gaps. Um, and I've colored the gaps by well, by colors and uh, you'll see here red, blue, and yellow. And there's a theorem called the three gap theorem, which is said if you do this process, you start with a point, rotate by an angle, rotate by the same angle, and keep on doing that, you're going to cut the circle into a bunch of um, lengths, and, but you all have, that, not a bunch, actually only three at a time. Now, eventually, you're going to change what the lengths are. So as you get up higher and higher, you're going to fill in, but at any point in time, you're going to have either two lengths or three lengths um, that you're going to see. That's the three gap theorem. Okay, but comment here is that the gap is larger on the right hand side than the left hand side. So if we put down 50 points and compare them to the same number of points, um, we can see a larger gap on the right hand side. So, so, I mean, the thing is that, okay, this is an irrational rotation. So we're going to get in a dense set of points that we go on forever. But we're not going to sit there doing it forever. We're going to only do it for a certain finite amount of time. So you do it for a finite amount of time, then you compare. And the golden number is saying, well, I'm more, in some way, more evenly distributed the points than I've defined it rational. I want to make that a little bit more precise. What's the right way of sort of saying that the golden number, does the golden number even most evenly distribute the points after a finite number of iterations? Uh, so we can just do that. And the golden number square root of two e pi. As I told you, square root of two is pretty annoying, but I picked the right number of finite number of points so it looks a little bit. Uh, more like worse, right? You see a larger gap per square to the golden number. If you pick just the right number of finite number of points, you might think, actually here, you might think, oh, square root of two is just as good as um, golden number. Okie doke. So uh, here's the three distance theorem, but here is roughly the, so yeah, we can do this quite quickly. We can just say, okay, I mean, there's probably a lot of ways that you could sort of measure that difference between these different numbers as you're, as you're putting them around on a circle. Um, but here's the idea. We call it the linear, linear limit density. But it's just to say the following. Well, um, are you going to look at the largest gap? But you have to penalize that largest gap by how many points you put down. Because right? you put a million points down, you expect to have a large, smaller gap than if you only put five points down. So we're going to say, okay, let's take the number of points we've put down times the largest gap that you see and take the limit of that as the number of points you put down goes to infinity. And just saying, okay, so remember, I mean, sort of almost scaling the circle by how many points down that you put down. That's the linear limit density. And so if you just plot the number of points versus the largest gap, 
you're going to see it oscillates like that. But you look at the, let's look at the limb soup, sort of the worst. Um, um, so you don't really get a limit, but you get a, a limb soup for that thing. And I want to compare the limb soup for different rotation angles that we could put down. And so here's kind of the idea, though, is that, well, if you were to just say, I'm going to give you a circle, and I am going to put down a point, and then let's forget about rotating for a minute. I just want to find the best way to put points on the circle so that you nice, nicely filling in the circle. So the natural thing to do next would be put it over on the opposite side. There. And then you get a big gap. In fact, this is a really good way of doing it because you know you get basically the best thing you can do, the smallest gap, the smallest distances that you could get for just putting two points down. The problem though is I put down a third point and I haven't really gained anything. The largest gap is just as big as it was before. So you could have said maybe it would have been better at least after three points had you put your first point here and your second point there. All right, so that's the idea of what you're playing off is uh, where do you position these points? So in the long run, on average, you're sort of best filling in the circle. And that's where we claim that the Golden number does the best. Yeah. And so let's just look at various examples of the, of the linear limit density. So for various rotation angles, if you pick the Golden number, so we can actually compute it in the case where the where the continued fraction expansion is just all ones or all twos or all threes or all fours or all hundreds or whatever. And you see the linear the linear limit density is smallest for the golden angle over no, this is actually golden angle. This is the square root of two. So that's nice because the square root of two really does look worse um, in that in that region. So uh, I'd say that's kind of a way of looking at the optimal packing of just points on a, uh, of a dynamical set of points on the, on the circle. And because of the following, um, there's, there's a statement. Um, so what we're doing is a, is a discrete dynamical system on the, on the circle. So a map from the circle to itself, which is in just case, just rotated. Um, there's a general statement in this context, which is that any, if you take any function that determines that discrete dynamical system, call it F here, um, you can define what's called the rotation number. Just do a certain number of iterations and divide by N. That's a number. It's, it's what's called the rotation number. And the statement is that the dynamical system determined by F is topologically conjugate, just the change after just the same thing after a change of coordinates to a rotation by that by that particular rotation number. So the claim here actually. What you can show is that um, rotation by of a, by the golden angle is has the lowest linear limit density under any discrete time dynamical system on the circle, um, uh, because using this you know this construction of the this topological context. So that's the that's kind of the statement there. Um, and that's yeah you know, we could just say all these things in more detail. But the interesting so here's another yeah so maybe it close here's another sort of open problem. So now you can just do the same idea on any on, on any discrete dynamical system on any phase space. So a natural one to do that appears in dynamical systems theory a lot is just to look at your phase space as being all sequences of zeros and ones, semi-infinite sequence of zeros and ones, zero, 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 one, one, one. It's, um, and then so inside symbolic dynamics, you take that and then you do what's called the left shift map. You take that, you chop off the first zero and you get the next point in that phase space you just chop off the leftmost points and you get a sequence of points in that phase space. and then you can put a metric on that phase space which just basically says how how many integers agree between two between all two points between two semi-infinite sequences and yeah so i almost thought that we knew what the what the construction would be to get the optimal uh, orbit under this discrete time analytical system and it was related to this idea of the Brine sequences, which is a combinatorial way of finding sequences that um, um, contain all sequences. So this is an infinite sequence of zeros and ones that contains all, like if you want to look for all sequences of zeros and ones of length five, they're going to appear you know, pretty early in this, in, this, in this sequence called the Brine sequence. And I thought that would be the right answer. It's not quite, I think. So it's really it's a really fun thing now. Okay, what's the optimal orbit? What's the optimal orbit within this left shift map um, for the, the this measure called the linear limit density? I don't know the answer. I think it's a hard problem, but there'll be another cool um, optimal packing in a way problem in this in this space of zero ones. 
So there, and yeah, thank you. I think we'll stop there. Uh, well, pictures associated with that, but yeah, so that's um, uh, that's that. And thank you very much. <laughs>
Biden that they did. Yeah. But we saw square um watermelons, cubic watermelons. So sometimes they can be, I guess. <laughs> that's a that's a very cheeky answer. <laughs> okay, so yeah, it looks so your very first slide, it's a silly question. Your very first slide in the background, it looked like there was a phone. I guess it was this is in the oh, greenhouse with a hexagonal oh, windows. I think it's a uh, um what are those fences called with a, a, a um it's a it's a fencing, I think. It's fine. It's fine. Yeah, yeah. Okay. This picture was taken. Oh, this, is this is from Australia, actually. John Palmer was a um, very good sunflower biologist. And... Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. We got word in Australia, Adelaide, maybe. But um, yeah, that, that was one of my pictures. Uh, super. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.